production that we call slavery. The issue of reparations as it has been framed um, in your theme talks to the intersectionality, this juncture between the acknowledgement that there is an injustice that has occurred and the place of how do we become reconciled as a society. Internationally, there have been structures in other contexts where injustice has occurred, where there have been commissions set up. Uh, in many cases, it is called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, everywhere from South America and Chile and Argentina to South Africa, we've used these structures of a truth and reconciliation uh, framework for a commission to help societies deal with injustices that have occurred. And one of the things that has been found is that in order to get to this place from truth, from some acknowledgement of the injustice to the place of reconciliation in a society so there can be collective movement forward as a whole nation and, and, and entity, that there has to be some form of repair. There has to be some form of injustice along that route in order to get us to reconciliation. I can't uh, reconcile the injustice simply by knowledge of truth. The acknowledgement is important and is a very important first step to deal with in, in dealing with integrity and honesty of the issue. But now we have to enter into some form of repair of that to get to reconciliation. And that's what reparations is about, the movement. Here in Boston, uh, it has itself has had a long history from the, the 18th century when uh, there were petitions made by those who had been enslaved for some form of repair, some form of freedom, to legislative forms that have occurred. Most recently, um, the first piece of legislation filed in this country in the 20th century was filed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by then um, uh, Senator Bill Owens, the first Black saint the state senator in the history of Massachusetts, who has recently transitioned. But in 1988, he filed a piece of legislation here in, Ma in the Commonwealth, which became the framework for a piece of legislation currently in Congress called H.R. 40, which was filed by Congressman John Conyers from Michigan, which calls for a national commission uh, to study forms of repair uh, that could occur uh, in the country. And, that, and it is important that we acknowledge that not only because this contemporary legislative movement began in the Commonwealth, but that the issue of the repair of which we are, are, are seeking is linked both in local communities, in states, as well as uh, federally and some would even suggest internationally. That this is not just a local issue, but without local action, we cannot get to the kind of impacts that we uh, actually need. Uh, this model of legislative um, action, either through the form of an ordinance or a commission, uh, has now been followed across the country uh, in the state of California such a state commission already exists. Uh, it was uh, pushed forward by a state assemblywoman, uh, Shirley Weber, who is now, Dr. Shirley Weber, who is now uh, the Secretary of State of California. And they are in process with their commission of exploring these questions in the context of their state. Uh, municipalities across the country, from North Carolina to Illinois, even in Massachusetts, have um, either in implemented some form of reparatory justice or are engaged in the process of exploring that. One of those cases is in uh, Illinois, Evanston, where there's been a commission set up to look at 
the issue of housing and they have moved to uh, implement it by uh, making adjustments of some $25,000 for uh, inequity in the housing markets. Um, Amherst is also look, has a, a commission that is in place looking at the questions. Other cities are looking at other optional ways of dealing with some form of redress. Additionally, however, uh, while the commissions are uh, dealing with the broad questions of public policy at either municipal, state, or even national level, and at the national bill, HR 40 has received, I think at this point, about 170 plus um, uh, co-signers on the bill in the House. Um, institutions have also begun to uh, evaluate this issue of redress. Um, Harvard uh, has a, an exploratory commission now that they are uh, looking at ways in which they might begin to address the question institutionally. Brown University, several years ago, uh, you may uh, know, uh, established such a commission and found that um, there is a, a very interesting, complex, uh, but important linkage between those who founded Brown University institutionally and their role uh, directly uh, in the slave trade uh, by uh, through the um, commercial farms that they held in uh, Cuba and the support in financing, um, as well as we will perhaps discuss a little bit later, the insurance uh, for the slaving uh, activity that occurred. And it was those resources that went into the establishment of Brown University and its contemporary uh, huge endowments. So, and this, and they are not alone. There are other institutions across the country. In fact, a national organization that has some 50 institutions uh, in the US that are exploring their roles um, and the residual benefits that have come to those institutions, the enormous um, endowments on which they sit tax exempt um, and that have continued to perpetuate um, this role of complicity in which many in the North, many in our institutions, whether they be foundations, uh, institutions of higher education or ecumenical uh, institutions such as the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, have all been complicit in the continuation of the institution of slavery and the residual benefits that have come to them and have been compounded over uh, decades. Um, there was a, a movement that began in the 1960s uh, entitled um, the Black Manifesto that challenged the institution of the church uh, that has been a central beneficiary. Uh, and residuals from that went uh, to support a, a group called the Interreligious Foundation um, for Community Organizing or IFCO uh, that has supported the community organizing that was linked to the thing we've called the Black Power Movement and subsequent community organizing for some decades. But it is nowhere near the actual residuals that the church has received and I'm saying church as an institution, aggregate institution, uh, and, and the benefits uh, that have been accrued. Um, so there is complicity in the wide variety of institutional sectors um, in our society. In addition, we must uh, engage the question of banks and um, insurance companies, those who financed it, uh, and those who are in fact reinvesting the residuals of those finance, uh, such as the, the Bank of America, Prudential, uh, the Fidelities of the World, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and they, many of those happen to be um, centered or very active in a city like Boston, which sits on the cutting edge of the, the, the structural transformation of global monopoly capitalism for the 21st century. Um, and uh, we therefore have to reassess what is our role here. 
But first, in the very first step is the acknowledgement that an injustice has occurred. It is at its core, not only a moral act, and it is moral, but it is political and it has economic and social consequences. We've seen the consequences of those in the color of wealth study done by the Federal Reserve, not by a private institution, not by a community organizers. This is the Federal Reserve Bank that has produced the color of wealth report that acknowledged the, the wealth gap differential in the city of Boston. I'm sure many of you are aware of this study. In 2000, I think it was 15, uh, that suggests that the um, median white family household uh, wealth in Boston was $247,500. The median black family wealth in the city of Boston was eight. Now, let's suggest there might be some statistical error. Let's make that eight, 8,000. The injustice via the, the, the functioning of the structure of wealth and the distortion in our local, this is our local community. I'm not talking about nationally and so forth, and we can deal with that later, but in our local community. The injustice is glaring. And the, the basis of the accumulation of wealth between communities um, has to be rectified because the economic consequences of this are not just the, the disparity, but they are the consequences that we're all paying. It's not like, you know, we're, 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 we're not benefiting or contributing and, all, and so forth. We're all paying for those. The, the school to prison pipeline differentials, the impact and distortion on the education in our, our school system, these costs, the, 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 the costs for healthcare for all of us that we pay for as residuals of the injustice of the structure of the system are already uh, uh, prices that we collectively are paying. And unless we rectify this justice, find ways in which we can ameliorate the situation, we will continue to pay this untold uh, toll that impacts our entire society. Now, in order to deal with this, it's suggested that the uh, forms of repair that need to be engaged are broad and comprehensive. Unfortunately, up to this time, what we have done is to look at the issue of repair uh, in silo forms. So we need to do something with the educational opportunity. We need to have DEI in place to access employment for individuals. The framework we're suggesting in order to engage this issue of of reparatory justice must be a, a framework that allows us to talk about this not as either or, not as education or job opportunities no, or uh, some form of, of wealth adjustments. It must be a comprehensive program. It must engage uh, across these institutional sectors. It must engage the private sector as well as the public sector. We must challenge NGO institutions, whether they be community foundations or private foundations, and the basis of the legitimacy of those foundations and the return on that investment. No, it's not just what are you giving? What is your grant base? Where, how are you investing the other 90 plus percent of the residual assets on which you sit? Because that's where the real money is in foundations. How do we engage the question of the church? It's been suggested that the most segregated uh, place in the United States is Sunday morning in congregations in this country. 
how do we begin to explore ways in which the church itself as an institution challenges itself to begin to focus on the moral base upon which it stands and the question of justice and reparatory justice as an institution, which it is, as an economic business, which it is. These are the kinds of challenges that, that uh, are, are being raised by this question and we hope will be addressed uh, through a commission. I certainly do not claim to have all the answers. Um, would like to, to, however, be able to contribute to a conversation broadly across our community with people of various ethnic groups who acknowledge the injustice that has occurred and are seeking to find ways we can institutionally uh, repair that. Now, to, for those of you who might not have been involved in this conversation before, let me go back and I wanna backfill just for a couple of minutes and then open up uh, uh, the conversation for questions that you might have. Um, because this is not something that just came up. I mean, this issue has been um, uh, raised in Massachusetts since the 18th century and has continued to be raised over um, the, uh, the centuries, very literally. Um, those who have uh, raised this in the past, for the most part, have had their uh, claims dismissed. During the 19th century, individuals who raised this, and there was a, uh, a large movement at the end of the 19th century after um, the uh, emancipation for there to be pensions, federal pension system established for those who had been enslaved. Um, ultimately, the leaders of that movement were imprisoned. Uh, we can go into a lot more detail about that, but what happened, they were put in prison. Um, and there were trumped up charges, allegations made, and um, that then was intended to stifle that conversation and that thrust, which it did. Um, but the issue is one that also has international implications. This question of the institution of slavery and its role in the advancement of monopoly capitalism uh, from the, the uh, 15th century forward um, is one in which all of the major European powers were in, engaged. And so there is a consequence of that. Uh, if you uh, go into, I mean, just the, the construct of what happens through this engagement of institutional slavery and the transmission of millions of people from one place, forcibly migrated to another place, uh, as you deal with just concepts of development, it is a dialectic. I mean, it is not a, um, uh, a um, it is, it's not a, a, a um, question of just one society like the United States, like Europe becoming developed. Di development is a dialectical process as something becomes developed something else becomes underdeveloped. Africa was not an underdeveloped continent. It became underdeveloped through the process of the transmission and the movement of millions of people to another place to develop those societies we call South America, Brazil, you know, the United States, uh, the Caribbean societies become developed and as a consequence, other societies in Africa become underdeveloped by the removal of that labor. And so therefore, if you look at the human index, the United Nations human index uh, in the, for the 20th century, the last two decades, what you will see is that three quarters of the nations in the world that are at the bottom of the index are either in Africa or led by people of African descent. 
Now, unless you believe in the biological inferiority of, of African people, there has to be a structural and institutional rationale as to why that occurs. And I would suggest that it is a derivative of this process of the forced migration through the tr slave trade of that population that produced the development and the triangular trade and its expansion over uh, a, a series of centuries. Now, when this issue was raised, one of the central places in which it occurred was in Haiti. Haiti, as you know, was the uh, single um, residual society in the West in which slaves uh, revolted against a state and actually won the, um, the rebellion. It's the only society in which there was a slave rebellion that was successful and there was a transformation of state power to a group of people who had been enslaved. As a consequence of the victory, however, Haiti wound up paying reparations to the French government for more than a century. Now we look at Haiti today, the poorest country in the Western hemisphere um, that has had all kinds of natural disasters and so forth that have been occurring there as well as human disasters. And we say, well, how could so, this country be so poor? But it was in the, the 19th century that, that Haiti won its, its liberation. And in fact, in large measure, because of Haiti, the United States is what it is. Because it was that forced, that, that successful revolution that forced Napoleon out of the Western hemisphere and granted to the United States at a bargain basement price, place called Louisiana. Now, Louisiana is not just like New Orleans where you go for Mardi Gras. Louisiana was, everything west of the Mississippi, almost up to the Dakotas. So the consequence of this has been enormous. And when the issue of repair for that uh, injustice that occurred with Haiti paying France for a century, the latest person to raise that was a man named um, Aristide. And when Aristide, who was the, the leader of the, the Haitian government, raised the question of uh, reparations and that the French then needed to repay uh, Haiti for the injustices that occurred after the revolution, hey, uh, Aristide was overthrown and was taken on a one-way ticket to a place called the Central African Republic. With this experience, the leaders in the Caribbean felt that it was important to not only raise this issue, but to do so in a collective manner. And CARICOM, which is an organization for the Caribbean states, came together, established a, 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 a commission to explore reparatory justice and have put forward uh, through this commission, a set of demands for against the uh, European countries, Great Britain, France, uh, the Dutch, um, and this is now in process of being engaged um, through the, with these European states. The leader of the commission also happens to be the vice chancellor, which is like the, the, the president in our system of the University of the West Indies. And I wanna close with this and allow you to open some questions. As the leader of this delegation, he has challenged himself now, well, how do we begin to concretize these ideas? And as the leader of the University of the West Indies, he challenged European institutions and has now uh, created a structure in which the University of Edinburgh has paid the University of the West Indies 20 million pounds and established a series of centers for uh, research and development, uh, scholarship funds, and we'll be working with them for the next decade um, in order to begin this process of dealing with repair 
in this case through educational institutions, collaboration between this, these northern institutions now in the University in the Caribbean. And the CARICOM uh, Reparations Commission is continuing to move forward with these institutional challenges to other institutions throughout Europe. Why 20 million pounds? Because 20 million pounds is exactly the amount that the British government at the time of uh, emancipation in the 1830s paid to the slave owners for compensation for their loss with the emancipation of the slaves. And not one cent went to those who were enslaved. It's for these injustices that we are pushing forward to establish a commission to explore the kind of complicity and direct connection we've had in Boston. Uh, and hopefully we'll raise this at the Commonwealth level following in the footsteps of Senator Owens and begin to explore this, but we can only do this in a collective way. Uh, and would look forward to uh, your participation in with us in, in making this journey and would like to entertain any questions you might have about the things we're attempting to do. Wow, that was that was so enlightening, Dr. Kamara. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think it was it was educational for all of us uh, at, at, at whatever level knowledge we came in. Uh, that was uh, that was so insightful. So thank you so much. Um, I I mean I guess before as people submit their questions in the chat and and be, uh, and I guess um, before we uh, when I see some hands up, we'll, we'll ask some questions. Before that, you you had mentioned. Um, you know how it how it um, yeah, how we do things collectively. So I guess the question I would I would want to ask is you know why does it matter to all of us you know regardless of how we identify. Uh, so what what is you know, what what sort of why is it why is it important for for not just one group but for all of our groups to rally behind this? You know, Leverett, um It's very interesting. Uh, first of all. I want to be direct in that we're all paying the price. All of us who are citizens uh, in the city of Boston, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, are paying the price for the injustices uh, that have occurred. We're all taxpayers. Uh, our tax dollars are going to support institutions, whether it be the criminal justice system or the education system, uh, that are, are residuals and the size of our, our criminal justice system is a residual of the kind of distortions and lack of opportunities that people have in the society. And so we're all gonna pay. And you know, I, there was, I don't know if you folks are old enough, there was an, it used to be an ad on TV, right? You say, well, you can pay me now or you can pay me later, but you're gonna pay. And we are all paying for that. And the, so, I mean, that's the short answer. And that it is much better for us to engage this in a way that allows us to restore justice and equity in our society, that allows for human opportunity and for the fulfillment of the real possibilities of all people in our society. And we can do that. In this country, we are so uniquely placed and positioned in part because of the expropriated wealth of slaves for over two centuries. We are in a position to be able to do that, to afford opportunity to everyone. And therefore uh, it is incumbent upon us, both morally, but as well fiscally, it makes fiscal sense for us to do that, to expand the base of our economy. It's been suggested, um, uh, there's some data about uh, roughly $20 million to the G, uh, GDP of our uh, community would expand by greater inclusion. I don't know how many people have, have come to me, I've lost track, uh, who are talking about um, the injustice that they feel because of land expropriation that occurred in the city of Boston. And we can go into as much detail as folks want. But it, those of you who are, are here in the city, 
will know that from Boston City Hospital, where we've had all those issues around the thing that we call Melnia Cast now, to Ruggles Street, down Tremont Avenue to Jackson Square, was homes. That was a community. And five decades, six, more than that now, six decades ago, all those homes were taken. That land was cleared, and it was cleared to establish Route I-95, which doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist there now because of the movement of people in communities to stop that highway coming through there. But the land was taken by eminent domain. People were put out of their houses, paid minimal resources, and they feel the injustice of losing their homes force them either out of the city or into other contexts. There was supposed oh, to be a giant property highway. Are the basis there. of wealth. We now see the distortions in wealth, in that wealth gap I talked to you about earlier. This is part of the rationale as to why. Wow, that was, I, I had this trailer. I had no idea that that, that, that was supposed to happen. I, I just kind of spoke out loud there. I was in such, such shock. So my apologies for that. But thank you. When for you sharing. come on I 95 from yeah. uh, Providence, yeah. If you ever notice I-95 stops at 128 and there's yeah. a little loop and you loop up and I-95 and 128 join until you get up north where when it crosses yeah. I-93, it continues north. Yeah. Well, why? Isn't that kind of peculiar that it sort of stops and I-95 and, and 128 are the same thing? Well, they weren't intended to be. From Dedham, they were going to cut it right through Dedham up through Jamaica Plain, across Tremont Street, up Melnia Cass, and connect into downtown Boston. Gosh, geez. And in the original design, there was neither an exit nor an entrance from Boston City Hospital until you got to Dedham. Wow. Wow. That's, that's ridiculous. But thank you for sharing that. No idea. Um, I'm in shock, but... Um, Let's see, in terms of questions now, I, I, I think Talisha had put one in the chat and then uh, Headmaster Chang raised his hand and then I think Devon was, was after that. So Talisha has a question. Is there a bill in Congress in Massachusetts or in, in Massachusetts about this topic? And if so, what's the name of it? Yes, um, to my knowledge, we have not submitted in the Commonwealth um, a bill. We're encouraging the caucus currently to uh, modify the original piece of legislation that was submitted by Senator Owens um, and to resubmit that um, in the uh, upcoming assembly. But to my knowledge, there's not one currently in the uh, uh, Commonwealth. But there is at the federal level, and that is called HR 40. Uh, which will establish uh, such a national commission. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Headmaster Chang, uh, you are next. And then after that, we'll ask Devon's question. Great, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Kamara. I really appreciate your, uh, uh, just uh, your um, uh, experience. And uh, I learned a great deal. And I'm reminded that the, um, uh, it was the Boston Shipbuilders along with the Hartford, Connecticut insurers that allowed the slave trade to happen, right? The tall ships used to be built in Boston. And so there's definitely complicity from the North. You know, we like to uh, talk down to the so Southern states, but we were very much involved in the slave trade in Boston and in New England areas. Um, and also in terms of the Alliance, I'm reminded that uh, until the civil rights movement, uh, led by our black um, leaders, uh, Asians were not welcome, or I guess um, uh, it's not a matter of welcome. They were not permitted to uh, uh, to apply to and attend uh, many colleges, our Ivy League colleges, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a lot of examples in which the Alliance enables other uh, groups of communities of color to access the same um, uh, remedy. And uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the eminent domain tankings, I'm also reminded that in Chinatown, 
uh, Tyler Street was taken, other parts of Chinatown were taken for the uh, Mass Pike as well as the Expressway. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if our uh, Black community is successful in, in attaining uh, reparation, then certainly that creates a precedent, right? And that enables our, our, our Chinese neighbors who were who had their lands taken but just in this whole question of reparation it seems to me that i don't think anybody disagrees that there is direct you know there's lot there's liability if you will there's harm but then the question becomes uh who is it that's going to receive reparation if we're talking about financial reparation right it's easier if you can identify like i don't think anybody disputes that perhaps the descendants of actual slaves you know if we can establish that through DNA or whatever, they're doing these DNA tests. I think that's less problematic or, or, or easier to accept than when it's an unidentifiable group. And that seems to me, that seems to be one of the challenges is, is figuring out. Uh, but then we're, we're now talking about systemic, for instance, racism, right? And to the extent it's systemic, then it's not necessary to identify to certain slaves and, and so on. So it's because it's so systemic. So anyway, I, I'm you know interested in this conversation, and I'm not too sure how it's going to eventually evolve. But uh, and then even talking about reparation, you know, twenty million dollars many years, hundred years ago, is a lot more than twenty million dollars today. If you look at you know just inflation, right? Not to mention the opportunity cost. I mean, imagine if blacks were able to access the housing market back in the uh, post-war era. Right. The, uh, I think the white the white families benefited from the GI bills that came out and they bought houses back when it was affordable and then that built their equity. Right. So anyway, I, I appreciate uh, this conversation. Thank you. No, well, I really appreciate your, your input. Um, that was um, it, you touched on some very critical points um, and I'd like to address a couple of them. First of all, what is the form of repair. Uh, the issue has come up uh, through the judiciary um, in several cases, one of which was uh, the case in Tulsa and uh, at the federal court level. And the, through the judiciary, the issue of the repair of personal injustice had been the focal point and therefore the court suggested there needed to be individuals identified as there have been in other cases adjudicated in the United States with regard to personal harm. And uh, therefore you would have to have individuals to whom some form of repair adjudication would be linked individually. The, ultimately, that case was dismissed initially that had been raised around Tulsa. Uh, and of course, with regard to the historical uh, consequences of the slave trade, there are no slaves or direct um, uh, persons who had directly been involved in slave who could prosecute such a case. Therefore, this broader issue of systemic harm is one that is now being focused upon. This would require some form of collective benefit. Now, the individual pursuit of harm has been, uh, folk, has been the focus of, for example, the situation in Evanston, Illinois, where due to issues of um, housing injustice, redlining and so forth, um, there have been the housing grants, because of the disparity in lending practices and so forth, to individual homeowners. The initial allotment was of, I think it's $25,000 per household. And it is, the residual benefits are being drawn from the marijuana tax and the tax on cannabis that is then the fund from which the resources are being drawn. Uh, in order to pay those allocations. The systemic issue, however, is also uh, one that certainly we would want to be exploring uh, for a number of reasons, but the larger systemic question linked to the Caribbean, our populations here in, in, in our community, so many have come from the Caribbean, and it's all connected. I mean, the, 
the vast majority of citizens have come to a place like Boston as really migrant labor in the transformation of multinational capital in the 20th, 20th century. In post-World War II economy as it has become transformed. That's why people come here and the base of our service sector, there is a, a, a so just part of a question with regard to technology. As our, the structure of our political economy has become transformed from a manufacturing industrially based economy to one of information and technology driving the 21st century, places like a Boston are really at the center of the conjunction of that transformation as to what our society in the United States will look like in the, in the 21st century. We're on the cutting edge of that. The character of an infrastructure and the, the, the blending of our populations in Boston is what the United States will be in 2050. That's who we are now. We are the leading edge of 21st century America. And so our ability to deal with this as, as a public policy issue and in uh, institutional terms, both private sector, the, the nonprofit institutions and the public sector coming together to grapple with the issues and the consequences of this, these uh, institutional and systemic uh, problems that we have had is a, uh, should be on our collective agenda. And for us to begin to put forward innovative ways to attack that problem in systemic ways, I think will lead the conversation uh, for the rest of the country in the 21st century. Great, thank you, Dr. Kamara. I, I know we're running a little bit short on time. I want to leave a little bit of time for you to uh, offer us uh, guidance on how we can help. You know, what, what are there resources out there? How, how do we, how do we, um, reach out? Do we reach out to you? What are, you know, who, how, how can we get involved? Um, I think there's five minutes to go. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel so bad because everybody has such insightful probing questions. And I guess what I'll do is I'll take the questions from the chat. I'll send them directly to Dr. Kamara, if you're okay with that. And then if you're, if you're able to answer them, I'll, 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 uh, I'll send those answers out to, uh, to folks who, who have the questions. And I'm, I'm very sorry, we're, we're running a little bit short on time, but I do wanna make sure that we have the opportunity, not just to hear and, and listen and learn, but to act. And that's something that the seminar has always been very good about is, is mobilizing our, our seminar family to act. And so are, are, are there things that we can do? Um, are there, you know, are there people that we can reach out to? Are there organizations? What are, what are the efforts that, that we can, we can uh, put forth to, to, to help in this? Help, help, help Leverett, we need help. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do, absolutely. And I, I am so encouraged by um, uh, the many questions. I, I can't see all the questions, but the, just the number of people who are, yep. seem to be um, uh, interested and the pursuit via action is centrally important. Currently in the city of Boston, the ordinance has been introduced uh, to the city council. We're anticipating that by the end of the month, the council will at least begin to, um, uh, through its committee structure, engage the question of the ordinance and by hopefully April, May, we will have public hearings. So being present for those public hearings, having your voices heard is extremely important. And in this effort, it is voices from across our city and across communities that is centrally important that will move this forward, not just the voices in the African-American community. While absolutely necessary, they are insufficient. This has to be a, a, a collective community engagement to challenge ourselves to deal with the question of social justice and transformation in our city and in our community. We have enormous possibilities to take a leadership position in our country in talking about innovative public policy and in challenging institutional investors, the private sector, our church, as well as city government 
around these issues, those who work in higher education, those who are working in the scientific and technological community, which is the cutting edge of our infrastructure for the 21st century. What do we look like? What do our institutions, our businesses look like? Who is, who is doing this? Who is doing the work? Why are there not more people of color who in, are in those places, in those institutions? It's not because of any kind of intellectual deficiency. So we have to challenge ourselves and our institutions to move forward with those kinds of opportunities. And the, the question always comes back, well, there aren't people, that you can, I can't find any, you know you've heard all that. Well, you can't find them because you haven't produced the pipeline. You make the pipeline, you seed it, you make an investment in our young people, in our communities. Is there a cost? Yes, there's a cost. But there's enormous possibilities and consequences for the unleashing of that potential. And that's the challenge we have and the opportunity. And those of us who are in a position now to have our voices heard, it's time for us to step forward. In each of us, in a small way, you think it is oh, my little voice, nobody's going to listen to me. Yes, they are. Because your voice and Leverett's voice and, and um, uh, Ace's voice and Anita's voice and Kelly's voice and Gus's voice, all those voices make the difference. We have that opportunity. So please be on the lookout. We will share with, with, with you, Everett, if you don't mind, exactly okay. when the hearing is going to come up. Those of you who are interested in becoming directly involved, please you know, pass that along to Everett. He can get in touch with me. The commission, the way it is currently structured, there are five um, organizations that have been involved with this and are doing work in this area. Not only us through the uh, Africana Studies Department at University of Massachusetts, Boston, and you can always reach me there. Uh, you can just call the university, get my phone number. My um, email is jamadari.kamara, with a K, at umb.edu. I'm easy to find. Uh, but there's also the New Democracy Coalition that has been involved with this. Um, you may have heard of the work they've been doing around Faneuil Hall and uh, other work in the community organizing. Um, there's Encuentro Diaspora Afro that has been very active in the uh, Latino community, particularly on that cutting edge as it has impacted people of uh, Latin descent uh, and African descent uh, and the implications for those communities. Um, King Boston, which has been involved with the movement for establishing a monument, a monument uh, and a museum and so forth for uh, Dr. King here in Boston, is in, it will be also setting up a research center and, and so forth. So these are all, and the NAACP, are all core and central to the uh, commission and the ordinance process. You can get in touch with any of them, certainly Leverett, and he'll pass your name on to me. And uh, we appreciate uh, Councillor Mejia and Councillor Bach, who had sponsored uh, the hearings before and are continuing to move on this uh, uh, issue now with the um, newly elected city councilor. Councillor Anderson is one of the, the co-sponsors as well. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamara. It was educational. It was eye-opening, it was thought-provoking, it was inspiring, and, and hopefully we all found it, a, a, as I mentioned, a call to action.